Hello, everyone, and welcome to Revive Health's Daily Briefing Live for April 24th, a 30-minute review of the latest, most important news, resources, and advice for health system marketers and communicators dealing with COVID-19. I'm Jeff Spear, your guest host for today and uh, for the podcast. No Chris Bevelo today. As always, we're joined by Chase Kleckner, Senior Marketing Manager and our show's producer. Hey, Chase, how are you? I'm doing well, Jeff. How are you? you? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's Friday. Happy about that. That's right. Yeah. We're also joined by Brian Cross today. Brian's Director of Communications at Our Lady of the Lake Regional Medical Center in Baton Rouge. Uh, Ryan Cross works with the Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady Health System, that's the larger health system, um, with locations in Louisiana and Mississippi. His responsibilities include public relations, crisis communications, and governmental affairs. Ryan, how are you today? Hey, how's it going? Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Ryan's in Baton Rouge in his uh, back patio, as we can see if you are watching. <laughs> Go Tigers. Go Tigers, <laughs> yeah. Hey, Joe Burrow, number one draft pick. There you go. Well, uh, as with each show, we're going to get into some good discussion with Ryan here. Uh, being in Baton Rouge in Louisiana, uh, different perspective than maybe other states and really interesting experiences that he can talk through specifically around dealing with some of the media um, and the strategies that have really been working well there. Um, but before that, we'll go over a couple things. As with each show, we plan on covering some news around COVID-19, how it relates to marketing communications, highlight some resources that we've got for everybody, um, and share what we're seeing and hearing from Marcom professionals across the industry. And certainly open the floor for questions. Um, as we move through the show, please use the question queue in Zoom to line up your questions, and we'll get to as many of them as possible. You can also use the chat function to talk to other attendees, but if you'd like us to answer a question, please use the question queue only. Chase will also provide uh, relevant links during the chat. So take a look there. You can also subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Just search for Revive Health Daily Briefing Live. We'll also post the recording of this episode by the end of today. And you can visit thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19 for that, as well as some other content uh, we've re developed related to the crisis. And at this point, I think we've been doing this is around five weeks chase yeah i think it was yeah five or five or six weeks we're almost almost on our 30th episode of this so wow there's time anymore yeah it's, it's hard <laughs> to track time <laughs> it is but for those of you out there uh definitely take a look at that once in a while we know not everybody listens to every podcast or sees all the updates we have but it's good to just see as you may be going through something that we've covered in a previous podcast or um, in some other materials there, but the recaps are really good. As always, you can also reach out to Chase, Chris, Revive Health Team for any additional help. Two quick important notes. We're not experts on COVID-19, so this is not a place for medical or scientific advice. We do have opinions on how marketers and communicators can navigate the crisis, so we'll share that. But every situation is unique and different, going through a lot of different dynamics in your market, and you've got to make the best decisions that, um, that you feel for yourself. So let's begin. We always start um, with the latest count. Very important to keep tabs on what's going on. We use the Johns Hopkins tool. And uh, today, as of right now, there are 2.7 million people confirmed. Um, and in the US, 872,000. Oh, no, excuse me, that jumped a little bit. 880,112 with we've now eclipsed uh, 50,000 total deaths. And 4.692 million, so almost 4.7 million tests conducted. To a lot of people. Ryan says here in Louisiana, we've got 143,315 tests conducted. Um, maybe you can just tell us a little bit on how people are feeling in Louisiana with so much worry early on about um, that might be the biggest place where capacity would be an issue. We saw a little bit of that in New Orleans, but what's happening today? Yeah, so our Department of Health updates the numbers every day at noon. So I'm looking, we're just over 26,000 positive cases 
um, and we just eclipsed 1,600 deaths. Um, what we've seen over the last couple of weeks since kind of mid-April is a flattening of the curve. Um, and in certain parts of the states like New Orleans, they've actually started to really descend. Here in our market, what we've kind of seen is a, a more of a plateau where we're sitting kind of near the top of that hill and we're, we're, we're slowly starting to, to hopefully come down here as we enter May. Um, interestingly enough, what we've started seeing in our market where we peaked at Our Lady of the Lake here in Baton Rouge, we peaked with 250 COVID patients um, at one time. Um, so that was kind of mid-April. Now we're sitting closer to 150 to 180 on any given day. Um, but we're seeing our non-COVID critical care volume begin to increase as those who haven't gotten care for things like chronic conditions like diabetes, heart failure, um, kidney disease are now having to be hospitalized because maybe they stayed home over the last month or so um, or they didn't get their prescription. Right things like that. Um, so our volume remains exceptionally high for the time of year. Um, and now it's just a combination. So I think that's the new reality that we're having to learn to live in is how do you balance COVID patients and, and what that's going to look like with your critically ill non-COVID patients, especially as we enter through summer and then back into flu season. Yeah. Every hospital is going to be getting that soon yet. I think either by necessity or as restrictions start lifting and for communications, that's, that's a lot to handle and manage so that you're doing it responsibly. People feel safe, people feel secure, but it's complicated. They want more details than they ever have about hospital operations. Right. Okay. Well, real quick headline from today. I think everybody, uh, if you're listening live and, um, if you're listening later, you will know this, but the new stimulus bill came out, $20 billion for providers. Um, as we've talked about before, sounds like a lot of money, but it's, it's not necessarily equitable or going to fill the hole um, by any means. I think our CEO, Brandon Edwards, calls it the, the tip. It pays the tip maybe, but not the bill. Um, so what the early analysis I've seen is that this is intended to help providers disadvantaged by the first round. They're using 2018 patient net revenue instead of, I think the first round was driven by Medicare um, fees. But right now that's still not a perfect solution. Uh, Modern Healthcare's article did analysis found that nearly a quarter of the 82 children's hospitals, for example, that filed CMS reports, cost reports, did not even fill out the net patient revenue field which is what we use to distribute funds. This is gonna be a complicated issue for the rest of the year, both in lobbying for state money, explaining why you need it, the federal money, and then talking about the financial pictures with payers and then now consumers. Um, Ryan, you, you know how difficult it is to talk about money and, and how things work with the public do you have you had any inquiries from reporters yet on this side of things we have we have so they started asking last week uh about in different markets across our health across our state we started getting various questions related to losses um, and what that looked like and so we opted to on monday issue a statement statewide um, and in Mississippi related to our health system's losses, which for April and May, our health, our health system will have lost $120 million. Um, not April, May, March and April, I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, $120 million uh, is our initial projection there. Um, and we've received, I think, $40 million so far from the CARES Act, from that early federal, federal amount. Um, and so I think it you know, as we talked with leg state legislators and as we talked with members of the media, it was really explaining that just because our volumes are high with COVID patients, that doesn't necessarily equate to, to revenue um, and that the hospitals can still be hurting financially due to having to cancel those non-emergent surgeries for PPE conservation, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but overall, the response and the reception to that has been, has been very well. I think people get it. That's nice to hear. It's certainly not what we've experienced before when talking to financial matters with the media who maybe have looked at it in a way that um, is more cynical, not trusting what we need and why we need it. But that's a great transition to what we wanted to talk about today. 
uh, Ryan just recently managed a pretty complex piece with the Baton Rouge Advocate, the local, one of the leading state newspapers uh, outlets in, in Louisiana. And we wanted to get into that experience and how it came about, kind of what the hurdles were and challenges and really what the reaction was. Many, many of our listeners may have had requests about doing in-depth pieces from their local media, even going behind the scenes. And that's what, what Ryan and the team decided to do with The Advocate. Definitely not something you do want to do with everybody. But Ryan, before we get into that, can you just tell our listeners a little bit about the ministry, Franciscan Mission of Our Lady Health System and Our Lady of the Lake? Yeah, so um, our health system, Franciscan Missionaries of Our Lady um, Health System, is here in Louisiana. We have, I believe, it's either six or seven locations here in Louisiana in various markets across the state, and also as of uh, as of last year, or yeah, last year, um, Mississippi as well, in Jackson mm-hmm. with St. Dominic's Health System or St. Dominic's Hospital. Um, our largest hospital, our flagship, is here in Baton Rouge, Our Lady of the Lake Regional Medical Center. It's a little over 800 beds, and it's Louisiana's largest hospital. Um, and, and so we're very fortunate. We work, we serve as an academic medical center. Um, we're our region's only trauma center. Um, and we were very blessed to have Louisiana, if not the Gulf South leading infectious disease expert, who is our chief medical officer, Dr. Catherine O'Neill. Um, so from the very early onset of, of this pandemic, really in early March, as it was creeping toward us and we were beginning to make hospital preparations and the state was beginning to prepare, our experts, Dr. O'Neill, um, Scott Wester, our CEO, were really right alongside and lockstep with the governor, with the mayor uh, uh, here in Baton Rouge, um, and with legislators and business leaders providing that much needed insight as really anxiety was just beginning to grow over what should we be expecting. And so we kind of worked lockstep with them along the way. Dr. O'Neill participated in numerous press conferences and press events early on with the governor and then continues to advise all of our elected officials on numerous task forces today as we look at reopening the economy and what is the next step look like. Yeah. And for our listeners, we're doing a little bit of a retrospective here on what Ryan and the team went through on this really important piece. But I think there's two reasons why it's relevant for everybody today. Number one is... We talked yesterday in our episode with Ryan Coliani, what learnings can you have and capture now to get ready for the future for your crisis and issues playbook? And that's part of what this is because we've got another surge possibly coming. But the second part is there may be reporters in your markets today or others, or just you yourself may want to show behind the scenes in what's happening to get people more comfortable with the shift between the crisis of COVID to COVID's still here, but it's not a crisis. And now we've got different, different levels happening in each market, but everybody's going to need to start treating patients. And reporters are uns- almost certainly interested in the operational aspects of that. How are you keeping people safe? How are you cohorting patients? So Ryan, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, you had this amazing in-depth piece run in Baton Rouge Advocate, uh, really highlighted your staff, uh, the team, the complexity of dealing with this. Tell me how that, tell us how that came about, what kinds of things did you have to consider to even do something like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So we've worked very closely um, with all the members of our media, both television, print, and online here in our market since really the onset of, of COVID. I mean, from Um, TV stations having our doctors on or in the beginning, the first two weeks of the crisis, we were on every single newscast for about two weeks. We had a physician Mm. on giving the, you know, the quick tips that people needed to know to be safe, to prepare. Um, So that kind of led naturally into, and we anticipated that we would end up getting the request at some point that a reporter, Andrea Gallo with the advocate reached out one day and said, Hey, what would the chance be um, that we could come and spend some time on one of your units, you know, in bed, uh, right. and, and get the behind the scenes of, of what your healthcare workers are going through. You know, I think at the time you were getting reports out of New York and Italy of these hospitals that were just overrun. There was video coming out that just showed mass chaos and pandemonium. Um, there were questions about PPE and nurses and, and, and physicians speaking to the media about the shortage that they had. Right. 
And I think in the minds of many of the media, even here in Baton Rouge, that was what was going on within the walls of Our Lady of the Lake. Um, <clears throat> at the same time as we were getting the request from Andrea the Advocate, we also had some national outlets that had made the request as well, um, all wanting to kind of dive in. So we took a step back, met with our medical leadership, our, our operations, our chief executives, and, and our comms team and kind of had the conversation over you know, should we do this? What are the, you know, the costs and the benefits? Um, and we really, we were guided by one of our early, you know, commitments to transparency that one of our, our kind of communications values, I guess, that mm -hmm. we set up at the beginning of this was that we were going to trans, we were going to communicate transparently to both our team and to the public as often as we could. Um, and so I think we went into it with the, with the inclination to do it. Um, mm -hmm. We also went into it knowing that what you were seeing on TV in New York and Italy was not the case in our hospital. That while we, we were treating at that time about 200 to 250 patients, um, and, and so our volumes were definitely high, we were definitely at the peak of, uh, of, of what we would see, even though we didn't know it yet. Um, you know, it wasn't mass chaos in our halls. It wasn't, you know, we didn't have, we had managed, we have an incredible materials management team that had managed our PPE supply. And while we didn't know what the next week might hold, we always had what we needed at the moment. Um, and we wanted to tell that story. And, and so we had to look then at the local outlets versus the national outlets. And we decided to allow the local outlet, the advocate and Andrea to come in with a photographer, um, we worked with, with, with the reporters and with our legal office and their lawyers um, to make sure that patient privacy, you know, once we got uh -huh. past transparency and decided that we wanted to do it, obviously the most pressing issue for us was patient privacy. Um, how yeah. can we give them the access that they need to show our team members um, while honoring journalistic ethics um, not micromanaging everything they saw, heard, or took photos of, but at the same time in a emergency room style or ICU setting where the patients often are not even able to give consent. They won't even know that these, that these reporters were there. How do you protect their privacy? Um, it's a really complex issue, but we were able to work through it, lay some ground rules, um, and it really went back to the trust that the advocate had in us and that we were able to place in the advocate through a long-term working relationship. And I think that was the decision that led us to choose to allow the local outlet to come in and not necessarily in, on the national scene where we didn't have that prior trust and relationship. It seems clear that there's a couple keys to that buildup. The, of course, the relationship, you work with them for years and talk with them. They know you, not as with any relationship, I know it hasn't always been exactly they do what you say vice versa but then from the beginning of the pandemic taking a lead, the position of leadership with dr o'neill the governor being very accessible and communicating regularly really set a really good tone between you and the advocate um, and led them to want to come behind the scenes and probably trust you and accommodate some of the things that you all knew were important for patient privacy example right and they had unbeknownst to us at the time they had made that request to other hospitals in our market and, and around our state and at that time had not been granted similar permission um so i think it was also to our benefit that we were the first to to, to open up our doors to be transparent say come in come see you know we want to make this easy for you while we had ground rules and we had to deal with HIPAA authorizations and things like that. We didn't put up a lot of hurdles. We didn't make it hard on them to do their job. Um, and so we made it safe for them. We, we even did PPE education with the reporter and the photographer the night before via a phone call to talk through like, you know, look, this is what you need to expect. You don't need mm. to be wearing a hazmat suit and gloves. You're going to be all right, right? You know, we're not going to put you in any place where you're, you're at any increased risk of exposure. Um, and, and then once they were there, you know, it was, they, they followed very closely with that. And again, the relationship was there where we were able to guide them, you know, through an incredible experience, which we can talk a little bit more about. How long were they there? Yeah. Tell us about the day. 
they arrived about seven o'clock in the morning. Shift change is right around that seven o'clock hour. And so the idea was to arrive right at shift change, do our little briefing. We met with some of our chief nurses just to kind of, again, talk about PPE, talk about what they would see and experience. And then we headed to the unit around 730. They stayed until about two o'clock. So, okay. and we took a, we took a lunch break. And so they were there for a significant part of the day. And did they interview any staff or was it observation and taking notes? We gave them free reign to talk to whoever they could talk to as long as it didn't interfere with patient care. Okay. And so <clears throat> so we, we, the way we scheduled it, you know, kind of approached it one of two ways. You either follow one person, you know, you just follow a doctor around the day in the life. We opted for more of a unit approach because we wanted to show them a variety of what was going on in the hospital. So we have a COVID ER um, that is because we opened up a freestanding children's hospital last fall. We have the pediatric emergency room that was previously separated from our main ER was vacant. And so we were able to very quickly turn that into a COVID ER for just patients with respiratory symptoms. So we wanted to show them that ER. We knew we wanted to show them a couple of our intensive care units where the most mm -hmm. critical were. We wanted to show them some med surge units where, where obviously the step down where they're not as critically ill. Um, and once they were on those units, they talked to nurses, they talked to respiratory therapists, they talked with, with our housekeeping, our environmental services staff, and then they talked with some physicians. <clears throat> we did do some work on the front end to know who was going to be on those units on that day and make sure that they were ready and prepared to speak to the reporters. Sure. And that went a long way. And, and so the day went well. How did you work with them afterwards, particularly with some of the photos they took or quotes yeah and and so obviously i knew based on i i personally shadowed the reporter <clears throat> and the photographer the entire time they were there so i knew what they heard i knew what they saw i knew what the you know the interview sounded like i had no idea what kind of photos there were <clears throat> so that provided a, a unique anxiety as we <laughs> that was on a thursday and as we went into the weekend we knew they were shooting to publish um front page on Sunday. And so we worked very closely with them. We had talked with our editors prior about, you know, a review process um, and it related to PHI <clears throat> that <clears throat> would you give us anything that has PHI in it or potentially could have PHI, would you run it past us just to make sure that everybody is safe and covered? Right. And so they, they sent us a link um, to some photos on, I guess it was Friday afternoon and then Saturday morning to review, to just double check that, you know, there was nothing there. We worked very closely with our compliance officer um, at the hospital to make sure that he was comfortable with it before we kind of gave them that thumbs up. <coughs> so I, the, the story came out really, really well. We've, we've all seen different stories, some that um, all dramatic. This is not an easy time for anybody. And, but we also see the stories where I think nurses feel like they aren't getting a chance to share their voice and maybe systems are holding their voice back. And there's just the tone and tenor of those quotes and the things that they say is, is quite different. The story that, that ran in the Baton Rouge Advocate was very, very good in talking about what the nurses are going through, what the patients are going through, the teamwork of the clinicians and the physicians. Um, and they even did a lot of things after where the, the reporters, I think, had about a 30 minute video Facebook Live talking about the experience. The editor praised the, the team at the lake for making themselves available. Um, really, really great. So tell us, Ryan, about the reaction after and, and kind of your thoughts about the impact of the piece. Yeah, so obviously we went into it knowing <clears throat> that across the country there was that anxiety with nursing staff. There was the desire to tell their story, to have people kind of peer behind the glass. And we opted from early on to say that we wanted to be their partner in doing that, not their opposition. Um, we, wanted to make it, we wanted to give them the avenues to tell their stories. And, and so it, that was reflected in the advocate piece. And in the follow-up, I mean, the, the – internally with our physicians and nurses, they really felt like it was a story that told their story, that did honestly peer behind the glass. And I think for us in communications, <clears throat> one of the big takeaways is that 
you know, obviously we sometimes would opt to not want to show the rawness, right? Yeah. And that raw equals bad. Um, I think when you're facing a pandemic, you can't hide from the raw. That when you begin to try and hide that just the, I mean, the care that these people are providing on the front lines, there's no, you can't clean it up. You can't sanitize it. You can't, you just can't. And so we opted to, to, to acknowledge that that rawness was okay. And that telling those stories was going to be all right. And I think that that was reflected in the positive reviews we got from administrators, doctors, nurses, all down the line. It's really good to hear. It's uh it's challenging balance. And then especially I think bringing media in there, there are some situations where the staff may not want to see anybody, but right. keeping a pulse and, and another important part, I think of, of everyone's job is, is you have to keep the pulse of the organization, keep the pulse of the media, keep the pulse of the community and, right. and figure out when's the right time to do something like this. And when is it too early or not? Um, not going to be really a value to the community or to your organization. Right. And, and the nursing staff and, and the physicians were, were such great partners in that. I mean, there's one part of the story, <coughs> excuse me, where there's a photo. Um, one of our palliative care doctors was going to go into a room mm. a patient that was vented to allow them to, to, to allow their loved one to speak to them. What was foreseeably for potentially the last time. And as the doctor went into the room, the photographer was right there capturing the moment. And on the phone, the husband was speaking to the wife. And when he said hello, and you know, we weren't in the room, so we don't know exactly what he said, but you, you saw the wife start to cry. Um, and she was ventilated, sedated. So, I mean, it was a, a quite a moment. And the nurse that had been caring for this patient for the last couple of weeks started to cry outside the room. And the photographer was there to capture that moment. And, and the nurse was able to talk about that moment afterwards. I mean, it was just such a real moment that really encapsulated COVID and what it's doing both to the patient, but also to our staff and our doctors. And that was able to be reflected in the story. And again, I heard more comments about that facet of it from folks in the community, folks inside the hospital, Miss Missy, the nurse, you know, it was, it was, it was incredible. You know, we, we started earlier talking about the stimulus bill and the money and, and what, what we're not getting um, maybe paid enough for right now and, and the financial hardships. Mm -hmm. uh, and really for the last decade, the narrative around what hospitals and health systems and all the people that work there, what they do has been often just whittled down to how efficient is this system? Right. Is the experience really up to par with what it should be? And how are you handling my bills? Right. Um, I think what, what gets lost is what all of this is for. And it's not just during a pandemic. These people are heroes all the time. Yet right, right. now, they're finally getting some attention. But that nurse that, that you just described, I'm sure it's not the first time she's cried because somebody that she cared about was losing their life and she did everything possible to help that person and had to witness right. a goodbye like that. Right. Absolutely. It, it, putting the, the face to healthcare and showing the faces behind it has really been, been an incredible opportunity in the midst of this pandemic and, and being able to play a small part in being the voice of our team and allowing our team to have that voice to the community is, is, is an incredible blessing and honor. Well, I think that's, that's a great place for us to wrap. And for all of you out there, and, and especially Ryan, thank you for being here, that are doing this to sharing that voice. Keep doing it. Push it. Make sure that your local media and your community and your team members know that you see them and the work they're doing. And it's not just a, a financial business. This is a business about helping people and saving lives. And all the things you do before that moment hits to be ready for that moment. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on and sharing the story with us. Thank y'all for having me. Okay, that's it for today's show. Please let us know there's something you'd like to cover tomorrow by posting in the Zoom chat channel. I guess not tomorrow, tomorrow is Saturday. Every day is kind of Monday. <laughs> Monday. Um, on Monday, we'll have Samantha Pierce. 
uh, Vice President here at Revive Health talking some more about um, media news coverage and trends and, and where things are headed and what we're seeing there. Uh, please remember to visit www.thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19 for recording of the episode. And remember to let others know about the podcast, especially members on your team who I'm sure if uh, are going through the nitty gritty details of making some of these decisions that Ryan just went through today would be really valuable. Uh, definitely building into your to your playbook for the future. Chase, thank you once again for being the man that makes everything happen here. <laughs> Absolutely, glad to be here. And all of you out there, hang in there, keep up the amazing work. The skills you bring as marketers and communicators are critical in helping us all move forward through the crisis. We'll be back Monday and every weekday until this all passes. Talk to you then.